And welcome to the September 6th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Could we start with a roll call? Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Commissioner Caput? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commission Alternate Mulhern? Here. Commissioner Leopold? Here. Commissioner Alternate Virginia Johnson? Here. Commissioner Bottorf? Here. Commissioner Chase? Commissioner Watkins? Here. And Commissioner McClendon? All right, we will uh, start with a review of items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, you do have a, a closed session scheduled today. It's a uh, labor uh, closed session, uh, conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code 54957.6. Is there anyone who would like to address us about items in closed session? Good morning. My name is Veronica Rodriguez, and I am the internal organizer for SAU 521, and I represent the RTC core group um, in RTC. And so I'm only here to say that uh, we were done with negotiating. That's a good thing. And that uh, we feel that in the core, the membership feel that it was a fair contract. And when you review it during closed sessions, I'm hoping that you see, you also agree with that. We had a, a ratification vote um, last week and it passed by 100% by the core membership. So they're also in agreement. So that we're hoping that when you go in closed sessions, you see and, and that you also uh, feel the same. You agree with it, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? Seeing none, we're going to uh, uh, go into the other room for a closed session, uh, and we'll be back here as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, there is no report out of our closed session, uh, but thank you for your patience. Uh, now we will uh, continue on with our meeting. Uh, this is a, a time for oral communications. This is an opportunity for people to address uh, the commission on items of, uh, of uh, 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 responsibility of the RTC, but not on today's agenda. Please come forward. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dean. I attended the Watsonville presentation about the train and all. Uh, recently, I read a study. I, well, excuse me. I read a summary of a study. Can't remember where, which s stated that um, invariably, when s cities or jurisdictions add uh, rail to their transit mix. The net effect is less usage of public transit. Don't know if that's true. I would like to know more about it, and I bring it to your attention because it seems like it would be pertinent. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everybody had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Um, first, I have a handout in front of you, an invitation to a get together. A from the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. My name is Michael Saint. And the reason I gave you that handout is the subject of our speaker, Melanie Curry. Um, the subject is the gap between our climate goals and our transportation policies. So it's an educational thing. So you're invited, I hope you can attend. Also, I wanted to clear up some frustration. I think the commission had last meeting at the August 16th RTC meeting and that was certain advocates coming up and constantly talking about HOV lanes, and I think that was a little bit of frustration for you. I just wanted to clarify uh, that CFST does not advocate for HOV lanes. I was hoping we were not being singled out <coughs> for that, and our primary advocacy is either for a no-build project <coughs> or dedicated shoulder for mass transit. So that comes up again. I Hopefully it doesn't. Um, but now I'd like to speak as a taxpayer and basically a believer in climate change. Uh, personally, uh, 
as all of us are getting tired of paying for the effects of climate change and for projects that do nothing to mitigate but actually increase our global warming, uh, i.e. highway widening for single occupancy cars and the cost that it's gonna be costing us in the future with the increase in our global warming. Uh, basic some of these costs, just two I can mention offhand, are the cost of the wildfires here in California. Uh, they primarily, we had $443 million of emergency wildfire funding that is presently exhausted, and I'm sure the fires are gonna continue for a month or two more, so that's gonna cost our society. And one that's come up that's uh, not surprised me is according to this week's August 31st Sentinel, what climate change will cost our state. Uh, basically, the taxpayer has a possibility of paying PG&E's negligence regarding wildfires. Um, climate change will continue to exasperate and disasters cost us billions of dollars in the future. Uh, this is why I support uh, not widening highways. Anything that costs an, an, uh, having to mitigate its own contribution of greenhouse gases towards global warming is something I do not support. Not to mention that auto travel is the most dangerous form of transportation. To quote a friend's letter uh, to the Sentinel, climate change is now a bread and butter issue. It's extremely expensive. Our elected officials and candidates for office need us to tell them in no uncertain terms that we're gonna be tired of paying all these bills and ask them what they specifically endorse to bend the curve into sustainability. And then we all need to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Barry Scott, I live in Aptos. And uh, I just have three thank yous for the commission today. Uh, first is thank you for your vote uh, in June to uh, allow Progressive Rail to become the operator. Um, thanks are due as we see the empty tank cars leaving town. Uh, this, was a, this was something that nobody wanted to, to see those things around and I, I'm glad to see that they're on their way out. I understand too that uh, that improvements are being made, improvements are being made to, to make sure that uh, freight service in Watsonville is continuous and expanding, and that uh, repairs are made at the crossings and the signals and so forth to keep this line uh, viable, and that progress is expected on the uh, washout at mile, mile post five. Uh, and the last thank you is thank you for uh, the speaker series, Jeff Le Jeffrey Tumlin, uh, last night, I enjoyed his uh, presentation. I'm back for it again today. Uh, thank you for having this. I hope that we repeat this, continue this. I think, I think it's clear that the community has a lot of, a lot invested in this, but there's also a lot of misinformation and, and a need, a great, great need for more information. Transportation is a sophisticated topic, and it takes speakers and professionals like these to come in. And I think that's one of the best things the RTC has done. Uh, since I've been following matters. So thank you for that. Thank you. Keep it up. Uh, seeing no one uh, else, uh, we'll uh, look to see if there's additions or deletions to the agenda. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have. We have one uh, add-on page for item 23. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's any item they'd like to comment on or pull from the agenda. Uh, Mr. Schifrin. I have a couple of comments on items nine and 10. I don't really need to pull them. Uh, this is the auxiliary lane, the cooperative agreement with Caltrans is number nine. And I just wanna raise a concern based on our, our experience with uh, past Highway One uh, project. Uh, it always seems a little tricky to me to have an agreement where we're paying the cost, but uh, somebody else is deciding what they're gonna end up being. And so, um, I, as I understand the agreement, the commission is, uh, contract is going to oversee the design and approval of the auxiliary lane project, but Caltrans is going to be um, in charge of the construction. And I don't, it's their road, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but since the Measure D funds are gonna be paying the lion's share of the cost, I'm a little concerned that the commission be actively involved in that construction process so that we don't end up with a $800,000 bill at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the time because 
um, things happen that the commission had no control over. So that's my concern about that. On number 10, which is a design contract, I'll just mention that I can understand why we're moving forward with a design contract for the auxiliary lane project before the environmental document is, uh, is certified and completed, but it's a somewhat dangerous approach to take um, because oftentimes the environmental document will have mitigation measures or changes as a result of that process that could change the design. So I understand why it's being done. I'm not opposing it, but I just wanted to sort of raise the concern uh, and maybe ask the question of staff of whether we have a, another date or, 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 or uh, maybe I've forgotten the date when the final EIR EA is going to be out on the Highway 1 projects. I'm going to defer to Sarah, but as far as I know, uh, we have not changed the date and be in December. Thank you. So um, for the EIR, uh, we are on schedule for the end of the year and we're very, very, very close. It's like uh, very minor wording changes at this point and the document's actually going to FHWA uh, this month. So we see it as we see the light at the end of the tunnel and we're comfortable with advancing the design. Okay, thank you. Maybe and as phrase. for the the first question you had about Caltrans, um, your concern for Caltrans leading the construction phase, if we decide later that we, um, we wanna take it on, we can amend the co-op and uh, we could definitely discuss that at a later date if you're concerned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before you leave, um, so I remember when you brought up uh, working with Caltrans and that was a very interesting discussion. So there's a give and take here and you're, okay, that's all I want to say. Yep. Okay. And I do have a question about yeah, the, no, I, on the consent, consent agenda. Uh, Sorry it'll be hard for the, the, for the minutes to reflect your question, but, uh, <laughs> but I pr appreciate it. So, Mr. Bertrand, uh, uh, the items on the consent agenda. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to either pull item eight or have it um, changed. And for the draft minutes of August 16th, um, when Ed uh, Bortoff was uh, chairing, I brought up a item for a future agenda. Uh, discussion and that's not captured in the minutes. It was stated at the meeting when I brought it up that it would be agendized in a future meeting, which would be this meeting. And um, so I'd like a review of the minutes as recorded and have the agenda. All right, well then we'll pull the item just so, uh, and I'll put it at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the day. So we, I don't wanna get into it now. Yes. Uh, we, uh, we have a, our first speaker is already here. Yes. So I'm just gonna pull this to the end of the agenda. That's acceptable, so thank you. About. So we'll pull that off the uh, um, the agenda and we will make it uh, item uh, 25.1. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so item 14, which is the approve the memoranda of understanding uh, extensions. Um, I, want, I will be voting no on that. So if you just, I don't need okay, to overly we'll discuss it. No vote and um, primarily simply because it's overly generous and not really interested in the interests of the taxpayers. Um, now I'll see if there's members of the public who would, uh, if there's any items to briefly comment on or uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to our commission for- I Move uh, the consent agenda as amended. Second. Motion by Schifrin, seconded by Rockin. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Mr. Johnson's uh, recorded as a no on item 14. Uh, so now we move on to our regular agenda. I'm going to um, uh, ask that we uh, jump to item 22 be, uh, because we have our state senator here, uh, uh, Bill Monning. Uh, this is uh, state and uh, legislative and funding updates. Uh, adopt a position opposing Proposition 6. Uh, senator uh, Monning has been 
a great advocate uh, for the County of Santa Cruz and has been uh, a leader uh, uh, when we've come to ask him or the Metro has come to talk to him about uh, transportation issues, so we're very appreciative of that. He's also uh, worked to pass legislation to make it safer on the highway with his legislation about uh, truck driver uh, education. Um, uh, and last year with the passage of SB1, it required a two-thirds vote. As Senate Majority Leader, he, he plays a role in that, and because it passed with the exact number of votes, we couldn't have done it without him. So good morning, <laughs> Senator Monning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members, and Director Dondero, I appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning. And um, I'm gonna offer a couple of overviews on our state budget in this recent ledge session as relate to transportation issues, and then I will focus a little on uh, Proposition 6 and some pertinent legislation related to transportation issues, and I'll welcome your questions as well. Again, I wanna thank you all for your service and with the singular focus of transportation and safety um, being interlinked in the work that you do representing Santa Cruz County and communities. So we passed a record budget this year, an on-time budget. It was our eighth on-time balanced budget. Unlike the federal government, we must have a budget that reconciles revenue with spending. Our biggest increases went to education, K through 12, and higher education were the biggest beneficiaries, as well as our rainy day fund, our reserve fund. Uh, that's the good news, and as you've all followed, our ongoing challenge in the state has been wildfires, wildfires that used to be contained to what was known as fire season. Now we have year-round fire season and tragic fire incidents from Northern California to Southern California to uh, Central California, Central Valley and Yosemite, and some of those fatality fires, both residents and firefighters. When I was elected to the assembly in 2008, our fire suppression budget was $50 million a year. The past two years, we've exceeded $1 billion and we're on the path to that marker this year early in the budget year, which starts July 1st, and we've necessarily had to go into reserves to pay that fire suppression and firefighting budget. Uh, we just passed at the close of session a, a joint conference committee recommendation of a committee uh, that was convened by Governor Brown to respond to the 2017 fires, the billions of dollars of damages, over 5,000 homes lost in Northern California, and trying to find a pathway to keep energy flowing to our communities in Northern California and having those responsible where fault has been found to shoulder the expense of those remedies and home replacements. Senate Bill 901, supported by both houses and now on the governor's desk, uh, addresses not only utility liability, but on this area related to fires that does link to transportation an allocation of $200 million per year for the next five years out of what we call our cap and trade funds, directing that specifically to prevention, to trying to clear brush and dead trees, to try to address uh, what we're afflicted by drought um, that is the biggest cause of these wildfires is sustained drought linked to climate change uh, and this new normal of dry uh, and dead timber throughout our forest areas. So part of SB1, a lot of the headlines have been have said bailout for PG&E. If you look down, I think the committee was very thoughtful in trying to balance maintaining services to residents throughout the state and having a liability equation uh, that does not put it all on rate payers. Where there's a finding of negligence or gross negligence, that maintains liability on shareholders of privately owned utility corporations. Where there's the result of drought, high winds, and sparked fires that aren't traced to the negligence of the utility. 
what the committee approved was the ability of a public utility, in this case PG&E, to issue long-term bonds to try to minimize the increase to ratepayers. So that's a little bit of an aside, but I wanna bring it back to transportation uh, as we start to look now at the benefits of Senate Bill 1 that we passed last year and which is now gonna face voters on the November ballot on Proposition 6, an effort to repeal that passage of SB 1 and the road protection, bridge protection, public safety protection that it offers to every California resident. As you have in your materials, I won't recite all the projects in Santa Cruz County, but every county in the state is a beneficiary and every incorporated city and community is a beneficiary. Uh, as was mentioned, it was a two thirds vote in each house, bipartisan support in each house to raise $5 billion per year to address a $130 billion challenge of road repair and maintenance. Interestingly, Senate Bill 1 was supported by the California Chamber of Commerce, by the League of Cities, by CSAC, the counties, Association of Counties. Uh, it was supported by the California Trucking Association. So part of this equation at the gas pump is truckers are gonna pay more for a gallon of diesel. And yet they supported Senate Bill 1 and they opposed Proposition 6. Uh, why? Well, their biggest investment is those trucks. The safety of their drivers is paramount. And they said, bring it on. We will pay more for a gallon of diesel if we can be assured that that revenue will be invested in road safety, bridge repair, road maintenance, et cetera. So voters in our last election passed a constitutional amendment that guarantees what the language in SB1 already said any money raised for transportation can only be spent on transportation. Can't be spent on high-speed rail. It's roads, it's bridges, and it's public transit. So you have in your materials how Santa Cruz County will benefit. Let me just highlight a couple of those benefits um, uh, that you have from your materials. Already since Senate Bill 1 went into effect November 1st, all of our communities are already benefiting from that increased investment. And most communities roughly enjoy twice the highway and road support they did from the prior um, uh, revenue stream. In Santa Cruz County, local streets and road projects have already received $7 million per year from SB1 investments. Uh, transit projects will receive approximately $3 million per year. The Highway 9 bridge replacement, $23 million. That's in the pipeline. Uh, highway 1 and Highway 9 intersection improvements, $3 million. Uh, bicycle pedestrian bridge over Highway 1 at Mar Vista, $7 million. And Harkins Slough Road, $14 million. And these lists go on. Uh, I also want to highlight, particularly for Santa Cruz County residents, the safety contemplated uh, both by the Route 9 San Lorenzo River and Kings Creek Bridge Project, $23,200,000, and the Highway 17 repaving $19 million. Friends, if voters vote to repeal Proposition 6, this all goes away. Supporters of Proposition 6 say, the money's in the general fund. The state should be paying this out of general fund money. I've already cited how we're going into reserves to pay for firefighting, how we've increased our budget to education largely because of our Prop 98 requirement. You know, 50 cents of every dollar we receive in the state budget by the will of the voters goes to education, K through 12 and community colleges. So that's 50 cents off every dollar right off the top. And you go down each category of our spending for health and human services, for other county supported programs, a lot of that budget is directed and earmarked before we ever pass a budget. There's very little discretionary budget maintaining a state that is now 
the fifth largest economy in the world. We've passed the United Kingdom to number five. We have a, a state economy of over $2 trillion per year, and we're supporting that with a state budget of $138 billion a year. That's transportation, that's infrastructure, that's public safety, that's response to fires. The volatility of our general fund, we're nine years into recovery from the 2008-2009 crash. You look retrospectively, most economic recovery has never lasted more than seven years. We're into the ninth year. Most economists say it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. We're gonna hit a dip. Will it be a dip? Will it be a crash? Will it be a major recession? The beauty of SB1 and what was supported by two thirds of the legislature is that that is a guaranteed source of revenue for roads, bridges, safety. If you relied on the general fund with the volatility of that general fund, there's no way you could guarantee and plan as transportation, committees, as Caltrans, et cetera. These projects are years in the design and planning and often years in the construction. The maintenance is an ongoing need that we're in arrears. The beauty of SB1 and the importance of rejecting Proposition 6 is to guarantee this steady, predictable form of revenue. And who pays it? The people using the roads. We're not passing this off as interest payments to taxpayers. This is a user pay fee. Those using the roads are paying for the roads that they use. We even have a provision where those that are driving electric vehicles and not stopping in our gas pumps, mm -hmm. they're still contributing to the wear and tear on the roads. And starting in 2020, they too will pay an annual fee for that share of of road repair and maintenance that they are contributing to. So I've got a binder, and I think you do too, full of, of road projects around the state of California and in Santa Cruz County. Not only will this improve public safety for those using the roads and highways, it will also create 68,000 jobs, high paying, good jobs, and the people earning those paychecks, they're spending those paychecks in our communities. So this is a win-win for the roads, the public safety, the bridges of the California, but also for our local economies in terms of this greater investment of those who are working. Now you're gonna see TV ads, vote yes on Prop 6, repeal the gas tax, repeal the gas tax. But you need to ask yourself when you see those ads, who's behind them? and what's gonna replace it. There's, there's no magic pot of money that if we lose this five billion a year of investment, Santa Cruz County will be a big loser, Capitola will be a big loser, the city of Santa Cruz will be a big loser. Every city in the district I represent, 21 incorporated cities will be losers. That's why every city council I meet with, every board of supervisors I meet with, say vote no on Proposition 6. I know it's on your agenda today, and I just close urging you to support that no vote. You will be in the company of public servants and representatives and public entities throughout the state of California. And I'm glad to answer questions on that, but if I might, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to thank thank the board for support of some of our bills that have made it through the legislature and sit on the governor's desk. You referred to my Senate Bill 1236. That was prompted by the tragedy that took the life of 25-year-old Daniel McGuire commuting from Santa Cruz to his job in the Silicon Valley and a truck driver with minimal experience, with minimal training, carrying a double load of aggregate, did not know how to use his gears to brake he, he ran into 10 vehicles, including the one driven by Daniel McGuire, who perished at the age of 25. Why was this driver on Route 17? Because his boss told him to avoid a, a CHP way station on 101 and circumvent that by coming across at Watsonville and go over Route 17. Um, we learned in, through the litigation related to that case of that negligence. But you know, not every tragedy 
is cause for legislation. But when we looked into this one, when we met with Daniel's family and, and took account of what had led to this unnecessary loss of life, we found that the state of Washington has a requirement for behind the wheel training for truck drivers. What I should have said, we first learned California has no requirement for people with a class A license to have any behind the wheel training. They show up at the DMV, they do do a driving test, a controlled driving test, and they get their class A license. Senate Bill 1236, supported by the Independent Truckers Association, by the Teamsters, um, is now on the governor's desk. And I wanna thank you all for your support of that. It has a minimal 15 hours of behind the wheel training. That's 15 hours more than truckers currently have to have. So I thank you for the support of that and for the patience of the McGuire family. Uh, this will be a lasting legacy for Daniel. It won't bring him back, but it will hopefully save other lives in the state of California. Um, a number of bills listed that you've supported. I, don't, I won't recite all of those. We did pass the committee trailer bill budget on transportation that also provides further support to infrastructure and transportation projects. Um, and Senator Bell, a good colleague who represents San Jose just over the hill, we share parts of Route 17. His Senate Bill 1328 uh, is now also on the governor's desk. That extends road usage charge technical advisory committee through 2022. That committee is trying to look at how do we reduce fatalities per miles traveled. And again, that's intricately linked to rejecting Proposition 6 on the November ballot. And I think friends, I'll uh, <coughs> pause there and welcome any of your questions or comments. Uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for your presentation, for your leadership uh, in Sacramento um, and for your advocacy uh, uh, against Proposition 6. I know many of our jurisdictions have already uh, taken a, a position of opposition. Uh, the transit district has also taken a position of opposition. Uh, we know how important it is uh, for these funds. Uh, in the, my rural constituents are, you know, they have a road, a Granite Creek Road, that had a PCI of 15. It was a barely passable road that's now being fixed, and then we have a big sign there that says, paid for by SB1, and, and we're trying to let uh, people know how their money is being used. So uh, thank you for your work. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. This, yeah, Scotts Valley did the same last night. You brought up the uh, issue of wildfires and the amount of fuel sometimes along with the wind that kind of breeds destructive uh, wildfires. I know um, that in the past there's been some resistance on local people f against responsible foresting that can kind of cull through the dead wood and all that fuel. Um, and I'm hopeful that you know, even though sometimes having, you know, people come in and cut down trees and so forth is, uh, is unpopular, but at the same time, you kind of have to get rid of all that fuel that just lies there waiting to be infernalized. I don't think that's a word, but. Uh. <laughs> I appreciate that, and um, that is part of the balancing act that we've tried to grapple with in Sacramento, and I think given the, the horror of the conflagrations afflicting our state, you'll find a much uh, higher appetite in Sacramento right now to provide mechanisms for that clearance to take place. I mentioned the 200 million a year. We also had it in last year's budget, 200 million, but now we guarantee it out of the cap and trade funds as an appropriate investment of cap and trade funds. But as you can imagine, 58 counties, 200 million doesn't spread very far, so we need other partnerships, we're looking to federal partnerships as well for a lot of our forests, our, our U.S. Forestry Service control, but that partnership between the feds, the state, and local um, to try to reduce the risk, that's, that's imperative. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Bertrand. Senator Monning, um, I appreciate the time I spent in your office as your intern. Uh, while I'm working on my public policy degree. Um, so following up on what Randy said, I think the education has been somewhat effective. Uh, my daughter phoned me up and said, Dad, we're going up to our property and we're gonna cut down dead trees. So thank you for your program, I appreciate it. Great, and thank you, and um, I 
I don't know if I need to apologize that our internship did not deter you from pursuing uh, <laughs> your current position, but thank you for your service. No, it's just yeah. the opposite. Thank good, you. Good, good. Uh, Mr. Rockin. Uh, first of all, uh, Senator Martin, thank you for your presentation. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning is the fact that the public often think that the high gas prices that we're facing right now, and they are relatively high for, for the United States, um, are due somehow to this, the uh, SB1. And it's really important to point out to people that the SB1 contribution to the cost of gas is still trivial compared to what's happening in the marketplace and whatever other manipulations are going on that cause us every fall to have increased fuel prices and this year to have them higher than they've been traditionally. And I think we need to make sure our campaign explains that to people because I have heard people saying, you know, gosh, gas prices are so high. Is that, have, is, that is it caused by that tax? No, it, that is not the cause of what's going on here and people need to understand that. And I just want to thank you for your very eloquent right. uh, representation of how important SB1 is to this community. Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning that. And if I could just take a moment, because that's a critical point of the fluctuation of what we're paying at the gas pump per gallon has much more to do with international oil costs and the manipulation, quite frankly, of our oil prices by the oil companies. I'm fearful and have some trepidation as to what fuel prices will be like in the month of October and whether there'll be any artificial manipulation. But SB1 fees went into effect November 1st of last year, 2017. They increased what we pay per gallon by 12 cents. It's fixed, it's not a percentage of what you pay, it's 12 cents increase per gallon. Last July, before it went into effect, I keep record every time I fill my tank, I paid 3.79 a gallon last July. The, the fee went into effect November 1st. In early December, I paid 3.15 a gallon. That included the 12 cent increase but it was less than I paid for a gallon in July. <coughs> now we see the prices hovering in the high $3, low $4 per gallon. Recent news reports, economic reports, storms in the Gulf have disrupted the predictability of oil coming from platforms in the Gulf. That's affecting right now what we're paying at the gas pump. And ironically caused by uh, global uh, warming issues that, that cause those storms to be more yeah, serious. Yeah, I appreciate your mentioning that. So it is important to look at the broader economics of oil and fuel. And again, to come back to this notion, we're the ones using the roads and highways. We want them safe, not only for ourselves, but for our children, our relatives, for school buses, for firefighters and public safety workers, you know, some of their response time is affected by our inability to maintain roads or make necessary improvements. So it links to our ability for first responders as well. Um, our messaging in Nolan 6 is to lead with what we lose if Proposition 6 passes. Now some will necessarily want to get into the discussion of gas fees and cost at the pump, I think the proponents will lead with that, but we believe the focus, that's a distraction. The focus should be on projects that are in the pipeline because of Senate Bill 1 and will be protected by the rejection of Prop 6 and go community by community. We can tell people in Capitola, in Santa Cruz, in Scotts Valley, in Watsonville, we can point to the road projects that are in the pipeline now that will disappear if Prop 6 passes. Um, we do uh, need to take action uh, in, in opposition, we, don't we? Yes, yes. there is a... Uh, so uh, uh, I would uh, be open to a... Uh, I so move. we hear from the okay. public first? <laughs> uh, I'll just get it on the table here. I move that we approve the staff recommendation, which includes uh, adopt an opposed position on Prop 6. I second that motion. Motion by Schiffer and seconded by Rockin. Uh, now we'll see if there's any member of the public who would like to address us briefly. I'm just gonna say thank you okay. all. Again, appreciate your leadership and keeping keeping our roads and highways safe. So thank yep. you all for your leadership. Well, thank you for your ongoing appreciate this leadership. opportunity. Thank you. Is there any member of the public who would like to come say anything? Seeing none. Oh, but the
Good morning. Just very quickly, Bike Santa Cruz County supports your recommendation to uh, to to have oh, a no oh, position oh. on Proposition 6. We greatly appreciate the active transportation funding that has been included in SB1 and is now available that wasn't there before. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else, uh, I'll bring it back to our commission. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you again, Senator Monning, for all you do. Um, I think this message to Southern California. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need a lot of votes up here is really what it comes down to. Um, I'm going to try to move through the, the, the other pieces so we can hear our featured speaker. Um, are there commissioner reports? Anyone who would like to make a, a quick report? Mr. Bertrand. Yeah. Um, last week I went to the um, Climate Adaptation Conference, and i um, like to point out the uh, fourth assessment has been put out. and. It's a very dense reading, but it covers many different issues related to climate adaptation and the issues due to climate change. So look for the fourth assessment, and I think um, many of the issues that you may be working on are, are addressed there, and the contributors are totally immense. Um, very good background behind the people who actually wrote the reports. Thanks. Seeing no other commissioners, I'll uh, move to our next item, which is our director's report. Good morning, Mr. Dondero. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. Um, just two items to share with you today. First, uh, last month we promised you um, a uh, quick report on update on the Unified Corridor Study. Um, the draft report of that study will be brought to you at the October 4th RTC meeting. There will be no action recommended uh, at this meeting for that item. Uh, during the month of October, there will be a series of outreach meetings to seek input on the draft document that consists of the following. A st um, stakeholder meeting with partner agencies, focus group meetings with community organizations, two public workshops, one in North County and one in South County, RTC advisory committee meetings, and presentations at city council meetings. Locations and times um, are yet to be determined on those. Uh, members of the public have expressed interest in an evening public meeting. Therefore, uh, staff proposes an RTC special meeting on the evening of Thursday, November 15th, starting at 6 p.m. that would be publicly noticed. At this evening meeting, the second draft document will be presented containing the recommended preferred scenario. The location is still to be determined for that meeting. Uh, there will be no action recommended at this meeting for that item. And the final draft UCS document will pre be presented at the December 6th RTC meeting where approval of a preferred scenario will be requested. Then the other item is uh, just um, to uh, remind everybody about our innovator, Innovators in Transportation speaker series. We have um, our final speaker uh, who will address the commission here today. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but also in two weeks, um, we have one more speaker lined up. She will not be uh, here to address the commission, but we will have a public presentation um, Wednesday, September 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the Veterans Memorial Building here in Santa Cruz. Um, that's, uh, the presenter will be Becky Steckler, and she's the program manager of the Urbanism Next program at the Sustainable Cities Initiative uh, at the University of Oregon. And her topic is impacts of emerging technologies on communities. Uh, be a very engaging uh, presentation. Uh, we will uh, have it recorded and post a uh, video of it on our website afterwards for those who can't make it. But that will be open to all. And uh, we encourage the commission to attend that as well. Uh, again, it's Wednesday, September 19th at 6.30 p.m. at the Veterans Building. That's all I have to report. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Other, uh, Mr. Bertrand. Yeah, uh, thank you, George, for uh, scheduling an evening meeting, and I think that came up at uh, a recent Watsonville uh, mm -hmm. uh, meeting of the RTC uh, from public comment, so thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Uh, then we'll move on to item number 23, which is our Caltrans report. Uh, 
Good morning, Mr. McClendon. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. I also have two quick items. The first is uh, announcement of the California Transportation Commission um, will host a town hall meeting on September 19th in Gonzales at the Gonzales City Hall. The agenda topics will include agricultural goods movement in the Salinas Valley, Monterey County transportation, uh, transit service in the Valley, and um, US 101 general overview. Uh, my second announcement is uh, a call for projects from the California Strategic Growth Council. It's part of the Transformative Climate Communities Program, their cycle two of that program. They're offering 46 million for implementation and 800,000 for planning grants. The program is uh, part of Assembly Bill 32, uh, aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions through developing and implementing neighborhood level transformative climate community plans. Um, climate, uh, our community plans include multiple coordinated greenhouse gas reduction efforts providing local economic, environmental, and health benefits for disadvantaged communities. That announcement's been shared with RTC staff and we've asked for them to distribute it to the Technical Advisory Committee roster. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. Awesome. I'll see if there's any brief questions. Uh, Mr. Schifrin. Um, it's partially a question, uh, partially a request. Um, there's a pretty significant litter problem on Highway 1 north of the city of Santa Cruz between the city and Dimio Lane. It's about 2.7 mile, uh, 2.7 mile stretch. Commissioner uh, Coonerty, who's the supervisor, county supervisor for that area, has received a significant number of complaints about that ongoing problem. Uh, the office has contracted Caltrans's maintenance staff and been told that um, resources are slim, uh, which is understandable. The, but we've also been told that at times Cal, uh, Caltrans does contract with uh, nonprofits and other groups to assist with litter control. The county is contracting with a group called the Downtown Streets Team to do beach uh, cleanup at county facilities on the North Coast. So they're up on the North Coast doing beach cleanup. Um, and so it, it may well be a good synergy between their services and what uh, Caltrans uh, could be providing. It would make a big difference in terms of this major entrance to uh, the city of Santa Cruz. So we've been in some contact with the maintenance staff. Um, but I was asked to bring it to your attention to see if there is anything you could uh, do at, uh, at, uh, where people you're talking to about pursuing this. Um, we're happy to help in any way we can. We're, uh, as I said, the county is contracting with this group. They're a very responsible group. Um, and we uh, really appreciate working with Caltrans to see if we can do something about what's a long-standing problem. As you may know, Dimio Lane is the entrance to the city's um, landfill. And so despite the city's attempts to prevent litter from falling off uh, vehicles, it does. Mm -hmm. And it, it really is a significant problem. Okay, I'll see if there's any other comments. Well, I wonder if you have a oh, response, that, uh, if there's anything you can. Well, I, I just, I wanted to get the name of the road that you. It's Highway 1. Highway 1 and the, what uh, It lane? goes up to Dimeo Lane, D-I-M-E-O. Okay. I -M -E -O. okay. Yeah, it's between Western Drive and Dimeo Lane. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut it off there. I apologize, That's fine. Mr. No Schifrin. Uh, others? Uh, Mr. Caput. You bet. Yeah, thanks uh, for all the work you've been putting in. And I'm uh, happy to see that uh, I guess it's uh, right on schedule. Is there a start date for the pedestrian uh, sidewalks, basically, on uh, Highway 152 from Wagner to Houlihan Road? It says winter, but oh, it, it's on schedule, right? Winter of this year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, if we have a schedule update, we would reflect it in the project update report. And 
uh, if it's this winter, then probably by the next meeting or the, you know, as, as we get closer to that schedule, we'll have a more refined date on, you know, more precise timeline. Um, so we put a general season, if, you know, the further out we are from the completion sure. and then the closer we get, we'll, we'll have a better idea. And it would also depend, I guess, on weather uh, and when you're actually ready to do work, if it's raining or something, uh, then of course it'll be. Right. Okay. Such an but, optimist. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, it is on schedule right now. That's right. That, that's what I'm concerned about. And then the other would be, uh, I'm sorry. Take me too long here. <laughs> On one uh, one twenty nine, uh, that's just about complete. Is uh, we have a complete date on that? Uh, Highway one twenty nine open grade overlay and metal beam guardrail upgrade, just east of Watsonville to School Road. Yeah, that's so that the comments look like that one should be uh, complete by next month, at the end of October. Okay. And then lastly, uh, the Lakeview Road construction roundabout and improved street lighting. Um, that is on also, I guess, Highway 129. Um, that's still on schedule. I'm, I, the only reason I'm asking this is uh, every now and then something gets delayed. I don't like surprises, so go ahead. I don't, it looks like it's all, everything's moving along pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the last question would be uh, something about pavement and friction. Uh, pavement, what, what is the difference there on uh, maybe the terminology is not so good, but. Uh, um, well, on on some roads, like on Highway 17, when when we install a high friction pavement surface, that is a safety improvement for um, for vehicle stability. On in Highway 17, when you have those curves and hills, so there's a, a higher friction on the pavement surface. That might have been where you saw that. Yeah, because I saw that on 129 also. Is okay. that usually on the curves? Yes. Is better traction? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, the last question is, how is that different than regular pavement? Has it got grooves in it? Does it rumble or? No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't rumble. I don't know the, the detailed specifics on the difference other than you know, it's a higher friction and it's better for the tires. So I don't know the specifics, okay. but that, that's about as far as I know. I know. I was just wondering why they wouldn't use it on all highways if it's better for traction, but there's probably a reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mr. McClendon. Uh, uh, seeing no other questions, I'm gonna move on to uh, uh, item number 24, which is the Santa Cruz County Measure D Taxpayer Oversight Committee. Um, uh, Mr. Mendez. Good morning, good morning commissioners. It is, uh, Shannon Matt Muntz, your communication specialist, is at a training this morning, so I will uh, provide a brief staff report. As you, you know, Measure D does require the establishment of a five-member oversight committee. Uh, so staff did uh, uh, ask for uh, applications. 35 applicants uh, submitted their applications. Uh, Chair Leopold establish an ad hoc committee to review those applications along with staff. That ad hoc committee was composed of Chair Leopold along with uh, Commissioner Nurse McPherson and, uh, uh, and Brown. And based on uh, review of those applications, the committee and staff recommend five uh, applicants uh, for you to uh, consider this morning. Um, and they are listed on atta attachment one of your staff report. They are Janet Edwards of uh, District One, uh, Michael Machado of District Two, uh, Abel Rodriguez of District 3, uh, Carmen Herrera Mancier of District 4, and uh, Todd Gwynn of Supervisor District 5. And both the committee and staff feel um, you know, good about the, the recommendation because the Measure D does ask that the 
committee represent the community as a whole in various ways, and we feel that this uh, group of individuals that does fulfill the, those requirements of Measure D. And so with that, uh, we do recommend that you appoint those uh, candidates uh, and also authorize staff to, to uh, begin the work with the appointed members uh, of that committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will just say that we tried to pick a group that is very, that is uh, geographically diverse, uh, use different modes of transportation, have great financial experience, um, and I think we've, uh, we've worked to put together a list that reflects uh, all parts of the community. Uh, Ms. Chase. Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, what you just said, Chair. I appreciate have the thoughtfulness that staff and the committee put in on this. It does appear to be a really diverse group, and I think that really represents Measure D uh, and represents the county well. So thank you for your work on that. Uh, Mr. Rockin. Move approval of the ad hoc committee's recommendation of these appointments. Second. <coughs> Motion by Rockin, seconded by Schifrin. I'll see if there's members of the public who would like to weigh in on this. Uh, seeing none, I'll bring it back to our Commission for Action. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, an important part of Measure D. Uh, uh, we move on to item number 25, which is our Innovator in Transportation Speaker Series, Measuring with Matters. Uh, we're going to hear from Jeffrey Tumlin. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mondero, uh, Mr. Dondero. We're going to uh, introduce. Good morning again. Yes, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today. Um, I first met Jeff a few years ago at a conference, and, and he, um, he uh, was able to uh, put together a presentation on transportation planning and particularly focused on public transit and incorporate a lot of humor into his discussion. And uh, it was, uh, I, I was very impressed, and um, I've been waiting for the opportunity to invite him to Santa Cruz County, and so when we put the speaker series together, um, it was uh, it was an easy easy thought to invite Jeff. A uh, little bit about his background: he's the principal and director of strategy at transportation planning firm of Nelson Nygaard. Um, Jeff has been uh, working for more than 20 years, um, developing award-winning plans in cities across the globe. He helps balance all modes of transportation in complex places to achieve a community's wider goals and best utilize their limited resources. He has developed transformative plans throughout the world that accommodate growth with no net increase in motor vehicle traffic. I think that's pretty notable. Uh, Jeff is known for helping people define what they value and building consensus on complex and controversial projects. He provides residents and stakeholders the tools they need to evaluate their transportation investments in the context of achieving their long-term goals. He understands that managing parking and transportation demand is a critical tool for revitalizing city centers and creating sustainable places. He's a dynamic and frequent guest speaker worldwide, and Jeff is the author of Sustainable Transportation Planning, Tools for Creating Healthy, Vibrant, and Resilient Communities. With that, I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Tumlin. Great, thank you, George. Is there a slide advancer that I can use for the PowerPoint? Are you able to see something here? Thank you. <laughs> and it'll be loaded up shortly. Uh, commissioners, uh, good morning. Once again, my name is Jeffrey Tumlin, and I'm so honored to be here today to talk about uh, transportation, about community values, and about how being clear about what your values can help get Santa Cruz County uh, unstuck and moving forward um, in this very interesting time uh, in uh, the transportation world where things are changing very, very rapidly. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what transportation planning and engineering is, uh, our role in solving congestion, a little bit uh, uh, predicting perhaps what your next speaker will be talking about with autonomous vehicles, um, and then I'm gonna talk about my experience uh, working with the city of Oakland to help get Oakland unstuck by clarifying Oakland's unique values. Um, so let's launch in. Um, this is a much shorter version of a longer presentation that I gave last night, so I'm gonna move pretty quickly uh, to make sure that you have time for questions. I got my driver's license on the morning of the day of my 16th birthday. I love driving. Uh, and uh, when I'm stuck in traffic congestion in my you know, little car sealed in and protected from the elements, 
Even for me, it seems really obvious that if I'm stuck there in congestion, right, if only there were one lane over there, like I could finally drive fast and surely that would solve our problem, it would be great. Or like if we can't have a lane over there, then maybe Elon Musk will give us a lane underneath and then we can finally uh, drive smoothly again. Congestion is extremely frustrating um, and it seems, you know, like an easy problem to solve, except for the fact that uniquely in the world of transportation, we pretend that transportation is divorced from the basic laws of economics. So let's review Econ 101. So you'll remember uh, from high school, right, there's the little charts that you had to look at. There's the supply curve, which says that the market will tend to deliver a good the more people are willing to pay for it. And there's the demand curve that says the cheaper a product is, the more people will want it. With that equilibrium point being the price, the lowest price that allows the market to deliver the good, where supply and demand are in balance. And for every commodity in our society, food and clothing and housing and your utility bills, we use price to balance supply and demand. In transportation, we do not. In America, Rather than socializing healthcare, we've chosen to socialize driving. And so rather than using price to balance supply and demand, we use time. Congestion is simply what happens when the demand for mobility equals the supply. Congestion is just the equilibrium point for any equation, particularly in a vibrant economy. And the other thing that we forget about in transportation is that it's part of a complex system. So congestion is deeply, deeply frustrating. So we argue for years and then we put together tax measures and we go and vote to raise the sales tax um, to widen the highway. It's a lot of money and it makes driving faster and so we're so happy. For most of the tools that we use in transportation, this is where the thinking stops. But transportation is a complex system and our actions have counteractions and reactions and faster driving means we make different choices. So we might drive across town to go to lunch because you know the highway was, was widened or better yet, honey, let's move to the bigger, cheaper house farther away because they widened the road. Faster driving means more people drive and more people driving means there's congestion, and basically every city in America is trapped in this death spiral, continuing to believe that this time, adding one more lane will finally solve the problem. It has never done so in world history. You can go to 10,000 case studies, and 10,000 out of 10,000, not 9,999, but all 10, demonstrate that highway widenings don't solve the congestion problem because congestion is an economic problem, not an infrastructure problem. So there are many things that we can do in the transportation industry. One thing that we have no control over, however, is congestion. It's not an infrastructure problem, it's an economic problem, and it's only susceptible to economic solutions. When you look at all empirical evidence. There's basically only three ways of dealing with congestion. There is managing it through time, which is our default choice in the United States. There is destroying your regional economy, which Detroit was successful at for a while. So they solved their congestion problem by simply eliminating employment. That's, that works well. Or you can use price to balance supply and demand, just as we do for food, clothing, and housing. So let's talk a little bit more about how our efforts at trying to solve the congestion problem have failed us. One way that they have done so is the way we measure the success of the transportation network. In my industry, we have one primary metric that rules all. It's called intersection level of service, or LOS. You've all been presented with level of service analyses in project review, and your engineers have told you, oh, well, we can't make that change because the intersection fails. So level of service is a measure of vehicle delay, and specifically, it measures the seconds of vehicle delay at an intersection in the peak hour as measured off of the peak 15 minutes. And it's scored in this sort of A through F letter grade system with each letter grade change being an additional 
15 seconds delay. So level service F means greater than 80 seconds of delay on average for that car, with the presumption being that level of service F is failure. The intersection fails, your poor municipal traffic engineer is a personal failure, 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 can't do it. Um, this is the excuse that we use for stopping all kinds of perhaps otherwise interesting change. Let's talk a little bit about the implications of that. So if this is, um, let's say this is Highway 1. So th this is traffic volume on Highway 1. You'll notice there's like a big peak in the peak direction in the morning and then a sort of reverse commute peak in the afternoon. And if that's the capacity of the highway or the arterial street, what we focus on is that. Um, and our task is to spend a lot of money raising that red bar of capacity in order to accommodate peak driving. Now, in any other industry that was actually wanting to be successful in business, they would not focus on raising the red bar. What they would look at on this graph is that. All of the outrageously expensive infrastructure that they built that is being completely wasted. And the challenge would be, how do you fill up the rest of that unused capacity, or how do you flatten the curve in order to make the most efficient use of your existing infrastructure? In transportation, we don't care about cost effectiveness. Um, and the result of that is that the best thing we can possibly achieve, given our current performance metric system, this is the ultimate success. Wow, I could drive as fast as I want at all hours of day on this street. Awesome. The absolute epitome of perfection based upon what you as policymakers have ordered your traffic engineers to achieve for you. Um, this street, on the other hand, this is University Avenue in Palo Alto. It used to be four lanes. It's now only two lanes. It's at level service F, not for 15 minutes, but for 15 hours a day. Um, it is severely congested. And Palo Alto could double the capacity of this road any day. It would be very easy for them to do so, but they choose not to because the performance metric for University Avenue in Palo Alto is not seconds of delay for cars. This is one of the highest grossing retail districts in California. The performance metric is sales tax per square foot of real estate. The purpose of this street is to create a community center and to provide the entire tax base for a city. So how we think about level of service varies very much depending upon your perspective, with a traffic engineer perhaps having a very different perspective about level of service than an economist. More importantly, level of service, because it's a metric of vehicle delay, it rewards the least efficient mode of transportation. So it takes 10 times as much space to move somebody in a car than in any other mode of transportation. Like, cars are the ultimate in terms of convenience, but their downside is space inefficiency. So if you're prioritizing the least space efficient mode of transportation and penalizing the more space efficient modes, what you're doing is making your overall system increasingly inefficient over time, which is not so good unless your resources are growing exponentially, which here in California, they are not. But more importantly, because level of service is a metric of vehicle delay, what it says is that a person on board a 40-passenger bus is valued at 1 40th the value of somebody driving alone in a car. And if you're on a bike or on foot, it's not that you don't matter. It's that you only matter insofar as you slow down the people in cars, the people who are the only ones who matter. So if you were to care about social equity, your current set of metrics for measuring the overall performance of your transportation system says the only people who really matter are the most affluent, wasteful people of our society. So it gets worse, of course, when you start looking at how level of service is dealt with under the California Environmental Quality Act. So level of service is baked into our analysis conventions under CEQA. So anytime you have a development project that comes forward, you've got to uh, overestimate the motor vehicle trip generation for that project and then accommodate that worst case scenario level of vehicle trip generation by either widening the road or 
what my industry does all the time is we shrink the project to get just under a level of service threshold. So we eliminate enough housing units in order to not trigger a level of service threshold change from D to E or E to F. This is a great way of um, avoiding uh, meeting your uh, housing need uh, assessment. Uh, but it's a, a useful tool uh, for developers and something that my industry makes a lot of money off of doing these sorts of analyses. But the best thing to do under a current regulation is to move your project to a more isolated greenfield location because a level of service analysis only requires that we look at immediately adjacent intersections. And if your immediately adjacent intersections are out in some rural part of the county, you're not gonna trip a level of service threshold. But you never have to count the fact that in that more isolated location, your vehicle trip generation rate is probably twice what it would be in a downtown location. And your vehicle miles traveled are probably about four times greater. And all of those trips are still ending up in downtown Capitola or downtown Santa Cruz or out on Highway 1 or Highway 17. They're just four times longer. But you don't have to account for that in the current way that we analyze transportation. But of course, our favorite thing to do, and the thing that we really make money off of, is widening that road in order to accommodate the worst case scenario level of traffic generation, which sounds like it solves the problem, except that by making it easier to drive, we actually increase the rate of driving, and we make it more difficult for people who are currently walking or biking or taking transit to do so by widening this road, uh, on this project, we eliminated a crosswalk, which meant people could no longer get to the bus stop. All attempting to solve the problem of congestion. So what we find when we look at the history of the California Environmental Quality Act transportation analysis conventions is that our over-reliance and misuse of level of service has actually created and in fact exacerbated the very problem it was intended to solve. And I would argue that nothing has done greater harm to the environment of California than the way we have looked at transportation under the California Environmental Quality Act. Now fortunately, Senate Bill 743, which was passed passed way back in 2013, is requiring that all local jurisdictions in California dump use of level of service and ideally replace it with a metric of per capita vehicle miles traveled. So this is something that the county and all local jurisdictions in the county will do. You have until July 1st of 2020 in order to do this work. Pasadena, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose um, have already completed the work and they're finding huge benefit uh, for everything that they care about, particularly traffic congestion, the environment, and social equity. Now, let's talk a little bit briefly about autonomous vehicles, um, because there's been a lot of chatter about, oh, all these problems that we've talked about with congestion, they all go away because we'll have autonomous cars and planes uh, that will allow us to uh, uh, finally avoid traffic congestion. So we've been talking about this for a very long time. And the imagery that we see today is no different than it was in 1945, um, except you know, video games have replaced the board games and you know, the children are gone and the people are of ambiguous ethnicity because you know, it's 2018. But let's think about some of the unintended consequences of this next technological revolution. So who's investing the most in autonomous vehicle technology? You probably know this. Google. Google, right. What's Google's revenue model? They, do they sell information? What do they sell? Ads. Yeah, Google's an ad company. Uh, about 95% of Google's revenue comes from advertising. So what is an ad company doing investing in cars? Like, it's very difficult to break into the auto market. Why are they doing that? What is the revenue model for the future of mobility? Captive audience. That's right. The revenue model for the future of mobility is not mobility. It's capturing the value of time of the people inside that vehicle. So one of the things that we realize when we start thinking about this and go to auto shows, which are very scary, uh, is that the future of autonomous vehicles, in addition to being having profoundly scary potential social implications, will result in a massive increase in vehicle miles traveled. Like if you could have your autonomous vehicle with your bed and your entertainment console and your office, why not live three hours away from work? Why not just have your vehicle travel around in circles all day instead of park? Um, 
why ever take the bus, um, which is more space efficient, when you could have your giant autonomous you know, AV take you everywhere? It's gonna be great. So convenient, because that's what Silicon Valley is the best at, improving convenience for the most privileged members of our society, because that's where the real money is to be made. But what about the rest of us? So what is the effect on cities? Well, it's uh, kind of disturbing. Like, there's some upside. Parking goes away as a land use. We're estimating, you know, probably about 80% of parking demand gets eliminated over the next 20 years. Um, you end up with some stranded parking assets, um, but you also end up with severe congestion and sprawl um, and really disturbing potential impacts on public health. Transit agencies, um, some people are talking about transit agencies just simply going out of business. Like, why, need, why do we need transit when we can all have our own little autonomous vehicle taking us everywhere? Well, there's some important answers to that, including the fact that we still are going to need high capacity modes of transportation, and particularly high capacity, high efficiency modes of transportation that are operated for the public good and not merely for private profit. So the alternative model in all of this is recognizing that autonomous vehicles will be successful because they are adaptable to the trillions of dollars of existing infrastructure that's already out there, our streets. And the streets are in public ownership. It is government's responsibility to assert public ownership over the public right of way and to very carefully manage that public right-of-way for the public good. And I think the government of Finland is one to watch. They have been inspired by the United States Federal Communications Commission, which in the beginning of the 20th century asserted government ownership over the airwaves and said, we own the airwaves, and we're gonna use the airwaves in order to promote innovation and private profit, but we're gonna make sure that there is competition in the private market, that nobody gets a monopoly, and in addition, we are going to promote the public good. We need to do the same thing with our roadways, which means, of course, defining what we mean by the public good. It also means very careful management of our streets. It means that with autonomy, we can finally use pricing in a way that is rational and equitable. We could provide people with mobility wallets, and if you want to use more than two square meters of space at peak hours, great, but we're gonna charge you for that, because we have a responsibility for keeping people and goods moving on the street. And if you want less space than that, if you wanna walk or take an e-scooter or take a bus, will fill your mobility wallet with extra cash because you are helping us make the most efficient use of this limited public asset. We can use price in a way that is actually radically pro-equity while managing this incredibly valuable asset. It also means that transit needs to get in the leadership position in order to quickly switch to autonomous operations in collaboration with municipalities because, again, the laws of geometry say we can move 10 times as many people in an autonomous bus in a dedicated right-of-way than we can in autonomous vehicles in mixed flow. But there's other things that we need to do as well with transportation. So I can't solve your congestion problem, but Transportation has a more profound impact on public health outcomes than the entire medical profession does. We are the ones who are responsible for whether you can get your 10,000 necessary daily steps as a part of daily life, as opposed to expecting that you're gonna drive to the gym and walk on the treadmill. Um, and the results are really compelling. So I served as the interim director of transportation for the city of Oakland for a while, and I discovered that I was responsible for knocking 15 years off the life of children growing up in certain neighborhoods because we had intentionally placed freeways in those neighborhoods and were dumping pollutants on them, because we had intentionally placed high-speed roads in those neighborhoods and were running children down in traffic, and because of the design of the roadway was denying our kids the opportunity to walk and bike to school, all of this added up to a 15-year loss of life and a loss of at least one grade level. That was me in transportation causing that. 
Um, and we know that this gets only worse with autonomous vehicles. The social and public health implications of ubiquitous, nearly free door-to-door -door mobility and designing walking entirely out of our daily life not only has a profound public health impact, but it allows us to socially isolate ourselves in physical space in the same way that we have done in social media space over the last decade that is already bearing itself out at the national political level. On the other hand, we know that humans crave social ability. We crave beauty. We actually like to walk or wheel in places, um, provided they're designed correctly. We also know increasingly about the science and biology of happiness. So this is a neuropeptide called oxytocin. It's produced in the brain in very limited uh, ways. It's the biological basis of human trust. And it comes when we're uh, uh, under breastfeeding, under orgasm, but it also is released in the brain when we exercise outside. And you've perhaps experienced this while you're arguing with uh, a loved one and you're about to say something you regret and you go outside and you go for a brisk walk or a run or a swim or a bike ride and suddenly your perspective shifts. This is your brain chemistry at work and we can design f around this brain chemistry provided we design our cities with people in mind first rather than just cars. Mm. Because we know also what happens when we design around cars. The fight or flight response that's triggered in the brain when we're stuck in traffic congestion results in road rage, which is a clinical term, one of the results of which is the shutting down of access to the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the part of the brain that allows us to think through the consequences of our actions. When you're stuck in, a, in traffic every single day, that fight or flight response and the connection to the prefrontal cortex becomes permanently impaired. And again, I think we're starting to see this in our national politics. The real function of transportation, I would argue, our primary impact, we're in the business of creating land value, um, something that we rarely acknowledge, but that's in fact what we do. Uh, we create land value and we also foster local economies, including um, small business districts. And so we need to be very conscious <coughs> of our impact on who's winning and who's losing as we shift land value around as a result of our transportation projects. And again, we need to recognize the limited geometry of our streets if we are no longer bulldozing African-American neighborhoods in order to widen highways. And again, Uber and autonomous vehicles suffer the same geometric limitations, particularly on urban streets, even though we can pack them together more tightly on the highway. Um, we are now, yay, congratulations, we are the biggest contributor to uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, in addition to continuing to be major contributors to other criteria and pollutants. As the energy sector has cleaned up, the transportation sector has worsened. And the way we look at transportation in all of coastal California, I would argue we are the worst climate denialists in the world. We have a big impact on affordability. Uh, in Oakland, we were struggling with rising rents. Uh, we had limited control over that, but we could reduce household transportation expenditure by making it cheaper and easier for people to particularly do something other than driving. And we found that giving free transit passes to low-income youth had a profoundly positive impact, um, not only on um, social equity, but also traffic and school attendance rates. Um, of course, there are 40,000 Americans a year that die as a result of allowing us to drive at 75 miles an hour while looking at our phones. Um, but one thing that I really want to talk about is our work in Oakland thinking about equity. Oakland is very, very different than Santa Cruz County. One thing that it does have in common is that Oakland is quite clear about its values, and it's very passionate about those values. Santa Cruz County has different values, but is equally passionate. In Oakland, we were very stuck. There was very little agreement on how to move forward on expenditures. Um, but there was clarity that equity is important. We just didn't really know what it meant. 
Um, and so part of the work that we did in the city was defining very clearly what equity means and noticing that equity is the enemy of equality, or rather equality is the enemy of equity, because if we simply equalize investment today, what it means is those of us who were born with great privilege, if I get an equal amount of investment, my privilege accelerates. Those who are born with a lack of privilege, uh, you give them equal investment, they fall behind, um, and that perhaps is not right. So our challenge in Oakland was, of course, over the last 70 years, transportation investments had intentionally stripped power and resources away from people of color. This is the redlining map from the 1960s. Um, of course, redlining was a, fed a set of federal rules that denied uh, mortgages and other financial instruments for people living in neighborhoods um, with uh, lots of people of color. In my industry, um, we got extra points for routing uh, the highway through areas of blight, blight, of course, being defined as African-American ownership. So this map uh, is very interesting and led us through a conversation about reparations that didn't go very far, but it did make us realize that we had some making up to do and that our task was to define the city's values in a clear way, and then to align all of the mechanics of governance with those values. It meant starting with values, going through a process of goals and objectives, of strategies that can achieve the goals, very importantly, making sure that we had quantitative performance metrics that relate it to all of our values, tied those performance metrics and values into the budget, and finally, report it back to our policymakers um, and to our, our residents about how we were doing. And it's most important to remember that the effective policy statement, the policy statement that matters is not your comprehensive plan, it's not the little mission that you put up on the wall. The only relevant statement of values is your budget. So, um, by having this conversation out loud in public in Oakland, we unlocked a massive amount of change really quickly. So we created this little department and um, together with you know, people in many other city departments in Oakland, uh, we, in a period of about a year, um, did parking uh, requirement reform citywide, eliminated most uh, parking requirements in the, um, the more walkable parts of the city. We completely restructured our approach to parking management. We eliminated level of service and rewrote all of our transportation analysis requirements. We created a new department and attracted a permanent director. Uh, we developed some new tools for analyzing equity. Um, we passed in a very resource constrained city, a $350 million infrastructure bond with over 80% of the vote. Uh, and then we did a whole ton of internal work, having every staff person see the values in the strategic plan and redo all of their work requirements and warrants and procedures and standard operating procedures in alignment with those values. Um, we got an immense amount of stuff done. So very quickly, I'm gonna look, walk through the, some of the analytical tools that we had to build in order to quantify some of this stuff. So equity, yeah, there's no like equity model that you can just pull out of a spreadsheet in order to figure out what this means. Um, and so we defined equity in Oakland by starting with outcome disparities. So looking at health disparities in our community, accessibility to jobs, and particularly issues that children and seniors were facing um, throughout our community, and we mapped it all. And we started with regional data that wasn't particularly useful to us. So we had to disaggregate all of that data and break it down by the census block group level and see the patterns in the city uh, about uh, you know, where low-income people were living or where seniors were living, and of course noticing that all of these patterns of disadvantage perfectly matched the 1964 redlining map. Um, this then allowed us to do some um, aggregate scoring, and we allowed our policymakers to weight each of these different demographic factors differently, but of course no matter how we change the weighting, that 1964 map still came very strongly through. On this map, then, we overlaid um, other data, including um, environmental resiliency factors, um, all of our uh, bikeways and busways, um, and of course, uh, where we were succeeding and failing at wheelchair accessibility, um, where we were having um, high rates of crashes. And then on top of all of this, we overlaid our entire capital plan 
which allowed us to do some very straightforward and visual analysis of the degree to which our citywide spending was perpetuating or correcting past patterns, um, which enabled us to have a very productive conversation about reallocating that budget in order to achieve our citywide goal. Um, and uh, again, we unlocked this by having a very, very difficult conversation about what Oakland's values were. Not what people wanted, but what their values were and where those values were in alignment and where there was divergence around those values. So that again, we, when there was disagreement, we had some tools for providing policymakers uh, uh, with uh, information that they can use for making those difficult calls and allowing us to move forward rather than just being stuck with arguing. Um, and with that, uh, there's a lot of material very quickly. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tumlin, for uh, a great presentation. Um, I've uh, had the pleasure of watching some of your other talks on YouTube. I encourage uh, everyone here to also check that out. You'll see parts of this and other pieces. Um, uh, you have a lot to share, and I appreciate uh, the work that you've done. I'm gonna see if m members of the commission have questions. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, so your premise is that everybody here is uh, who took or drove their car today is affluent, wasteful, and privileged. And even though the values of this community might lend itself to uh, correcting climate change, taking public transportation, um, the m number of people here, either through because they like the freedom of their cars or whatever, probably chose to drive a car. Now, were you, were you one of those? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I, I am, so, and, so am and an enthusiastic motorist. I love driving. Right. And I love free parking as well. So there's, there's <laughs> a hypocrisy embedded, really, in, I think, in your message to the degree that everybody kind of sees the values, everybody sees the goals and objectives, but nobody wants to really follow what you just described here in a really nice presentation. So I guess, you know, I'm feeling a little bit of guilt. I feel you're a little bit unctuous in terms of, you know, preaching to us that this is a way to go, but at the same time, are you really willing to follow the same values that you're saying the rest of us should? So uh, good question and a very common question. So I think it's incredibly important not to moralize around transportation choices. This conversation that I just gave you was a little bit more about economics. So yeah, I, oftentimes drive, sometimes I walk, sometimes I do other things. The question is, to what degree should my choices be subsidized by government? So right now, every parking space that I get for free, I love that, I will go out of my way for free parking, but I also know that it costs me $10 a day, it costs somebody $10 a day to deliver that parking free to me. Um, that's a real cost, uh, I parked free at my hotel last night, and I know that the cost of that was simply bundled into my room rate. And so the person staying next door to me who didn't bring a car, she was subsidizing my free parking. So she shouldn't moralize or feel guilty. We should simply ask, is it efficient to provide parking and driving free while it costs $2 to take the bus? Does that make sense? And if I want to be able to drive and park, having a uh, government subsidize other people driving in front of me, that perhaps does not get us what our objective might be, which is to be able to drive when we need to drive and to provide an equivalent amount of subsidy for other people who may want to do something else. That the result of assuming that all driving and parking should be free is actually creating a very bad situation for motorists who need to drive. Um, and of course, there are many very low income people um, who have no choice but to spend a very large percentage of their household time and money on driving in order to access employment. Um, I think in many ways, the low income folks are most disadvantaged by the inequity of our current approach. Uh, particularly when they're stuck in congestion trying to get to their two jobs and daycare in order to make their very challenging lives work. So 
I, yeah, again, I, I'm not trying to moralize. I'm trying to help us understand the consequences of well-intentioned actions. The congestion consequences, the financial consequences, and the social equity consequences. Thank you. Mr. Bertrand. Um, again, thank you for your talk and your manner of delivering. So in terms of parking and economic uh, activity in downtown areas or other areas in, like Main Street, that kind of thing, um, can you talk a little bit about the availability of parking, the pricing of parking, the mm -hmm. timing of the pricing, like evening may be free during the day, it's higher, and the economic activity on a street with your um, economic way of looking at supply demand that we want to generate money. So the Palo Alto example was a good one. Sure, so uh, parking, very controversial topic. Um, also a really fun one and a, and a topic where um, there's a, a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance, which I sometimes enjoy. Um, so parking is super important for the functioning of any place, particularly downtowns. Downtowns require the right amount of parking. But it's important to recognize that there's several optimization games that we need to play. That particularly in a downtown environment, too much parking is worse than too little parking. The challenge is to figure out what's the right amount of parking, and then to recognize that parking is an incredibly expensive asset. Uh, and we need to manage that capital asset effectively. So again, uh, we've got limited tools for balancing supply and demand. In the parking world, price is the most effective tool. And the right price for parking is always the lowest price that helps you achieve about a 10% availability target in every parking lot, in every parking garage, and every block. So the right price is always the lowest price that makes it easy for a customer or an employee to always find a parking space wherever she's trying to find one. Um, and what this means is that if there's plenty of availability, the right price of parking is free. That's perfectly fine to have free parking. Um, but if there's parking congestion, you need to adjust the price in order to achieve that availability target. And that means the price is gonna vary tremendously. Like the price on Main Street is gonna be a lot higher than in the parking lot around the corner. The price on the street is gonna be a lot higher than the price inside a creepy parking garage that people don't actually wanna park in, even though it costs more to build that parking garage. The price is going to be uh, perhaps more expensive on a Friday or Saturday. And there's nothing in Leviticus that says that parking has to be free on the day of the Lord. So the reason we don't charge for parking on Sundays is because we haven't updated our parking regulations since 1955 <laughs> when stores were closed on Sundays. So again, it's simply taking a resource management approach with a goal being radically good customer service aimed at a successful commercial district. It's also important to recognize that because parking is so outrageously expensive to build or even to maintain, that sometimes it's cheaper to do something like provide free transit passes to all downtown employees than it is to build your next parking structure. Sometimes it's cheaper to invest in bikeways than it is to invest in parking structure if that serves more people. So parking is simply a form of access and the right approach is about figuring out what's the most cost-effective mix of investments in order to get access to the point where you've optimized the success of the district. Ms. Brown. Oh, I, I think you pretty much answered the question, but I, I just was wondering, because you, you acknowledge the, um, the fact that there are certain people in our community who don't necessarily get to choose to pay that much more money or you know factor that in in their rational economic decision making they just must get to work and in places where there isn't public transit or other alternatives available and so i'm just but those are questions about the broader market and other kinds of regulatory um, decision making outside of the traffic and transportation planning. So I'm just wondering, in your discussions, maybe using the case of Oakland, how you uh, discuss that those challenges, because as we know, people yep. who can choose to pay more uh, or commute at certain times will do that, and those who can't still must. And so just wondering how that... Yeah, so, so uh, firstly, you need to lead with equity and take it very seriously. Um, and that means having conversations uh, with uh, disadvantaged people, people of color, low-income people, rather than speaking for them. Um, and it's amazing what you learn when you actually go out and talk to low-income families. Like, wow, um, 
low-income families oftentimes place a much higher value on their time than affluent families, um, in part because their lives are more complex and they have to travel longer distances. Uh, and like if you, you know, you're charged by the minute when you're late to pick up your kid at daycare. Mm -hmm. So the first part of it is actually talking to affected populations um, rather than having people speak for them. The other is recognizing that any time you change the rules of the game, there are winners and losers. Uh, and you know, our, you know, your task as government is to try to find the solution that creates the greatest total net benefit, recognizing that there's gonna be individuals, and in, no matter what you do, that are gonna be negatively impacted. It also means recognizing that the status quo is radically inequitable. Um, and so, you know, changing it, don't be afraid of, of changing it, because the status quo is not working. So other things that you can do, uh, and we certainly had these conversations in Oakland, was you can means test. So in transit, we means test for transit passes. Driving is free, you have to pay to take transit, but if you're low income, you can qualify for a discount. You can do the same thing with parking, you can do the same thing with roadway pricing. Um, you can also ask the question, if there's net revenue as a result of this change, what are we doing with that net revenue? Are we taking that money and creating better choices and more affordable choices for those who've been disadvantaged by past decisions? Or are we um, basically creating more convenience for the most privileged members of society? So that's, that's a very big question. Those are some quick um, things to start looking at um, as you start thinking about change. Thank you. Mr. Schiffer. Yes, thank you um, for your presentation. <clears throat> Clearly, you're at the forefront of transportation policy in the state because the state has changed, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about level of service. Um, level of service has, as you said, been used for many years. Um, it's not so simple to go to vehicle mi miles traveled. Uh, I've been following the state's attempt to the CEQA guidelines to come up with a procedure to measure vehicle miles traveled. And it's, it's kind of complicated, and I think it's going to end up providing more funding for traffic engineers than uh, <laughs> was um, required for a level of service. But I, I think I have an underlying concern, and I, it leads to a question. A lot of the current idea of uh, not requiring parking near transit stops, uh, not looking at level of service because uh, um, there, you know, we want to encourage bikes and walking, not just car travel, is based kind of on an assumption that if you don't pro provide parking, people won't, own, people won't own, own cars. If they're close to a transit stop, uh, then you don't need to provide parking. Uh, you don't need to deal with congestion because the new development, you'll have more new development and people won't be having cars. And I wonder if, I, I've never seen any studies that document that, because in my sort of anecdotal experience, people who can afford cars have cars, and they use them. Uh, maybe they use them a little less during peak hour, maybe they don't. But I just wonder if there is any um, good data that documents this move to eliminate parking. What we've seen in Santa Cruz is that streets are becoming private. You can't park on one of the, uh, a number of streets at any time unless you have a permit because the city, uh, because the, even two hours, you can't park for two hours on one of our major streets near the downtown unless you have a, unless you live in the neighborhood because so, what, we're, what I think we're seeing is as we move away from requiring new development to provide parking, it doesn't stop people from having cars, it just means that there's pressure on the local government to not allow anybody else to park on the streets that they pay for. So let me go back to, I'll stop okay. uh, so philosophizing couple, and go couple, back to the question about what the data is around mm -hmm. uh, whether by not, uh, by not providing parking, it really reduces the amount of cars that people have. Yes, so there's abundant data. So first of all, one of the things I wanna make sure is clear that currently most governments force developers to supply more parking than the market warrants. So if you eliminate minimum parking requirements, it's not like developers will forget to build parking. Developers will just 
build the right amount of parking for their project. We don't force developers to only build three bedroom units because people have an average of 2.0 children. We do take the highest household auto ownership and force everyone to have that many parking spaces. Like, so government doesn't interfere with the private development market to force more bedrooms or housing units for people. Government only interferes with the market to force more housing units for cars. And the result of that is four housing units for every car in Santa Cruz County um, when we don't have enough housing units for people. So eliminating minimum parking requirements simply means the developers will supply the right amount of parking because they're going to need to just to get financing for their project. The other thing is that uh, what we find in the data, um, and this is true in, you know, I mean, all the urban markets, the places that have eliminated minimum parking requirements, that there is a tremendous amount of self-selection in the market. People don't buy a three-bedroom unit if they just have one person, and a family of 10 doesn't get a studio apartment, uh, not realizing that there's not a place to stash their children. People tend to rent and buy housing that matches their lifestyle. Um, all minimum parking requirements do is allow us to avoid managing the public right-of-way. I live in San Francisco. The city and county of San Francisco gives me, oh, about, it's probably $1,000 a month of free real estate where I just leave my private goods out in the public right-of-way um, thanks to the taxpayers of San Francisco. It, it makes no sense that um, that San Francisco prevents the construction of housing for people uh, as a way of avoiding managing the public right-of-way and free storage of private goods on public land. That was not as eloquent as I should have stated it, but again, what we find in the data is that there is a strong tendency, um, and San Francisco has perhaps analyzed this more than anyone, um, in their process not only of eliminating minimum parking requirements, but ascribing vehicle trip generation rate based upon parking supply. Um, the best data on the relationship between traffic generation and parking supply you can find in San Francisco, um, where uh, they clearly determined that there is limited relationship between the size of a building and the vehicle trip generation rate, that there's a far stronger correlation between vehicle trip generation rate and parking supply as a result of self-selection. Employment, you know, an office building that comes with no parking, regardless of who's using that office building, it's going to have a far lower rate of vehicle trip generation than an office building with a giant parking lot. Similarly for housing. Um, people choose the house or office that works for them and their personal desires. Right now, our requirements say the only acceptable lifestyle is an auto-dependent lifestyle, either for the home end or the work end. Of course, San Francisco has a public transportation system a little bit more uh, extensive than Santa Cruz County and has a, a, you know, a downtown where huge numbers of people. You know, yeah, so Fayetteville, Arkansas, and Buffalo, New York have, in, have eliminated minimum parking requirements as well. They don't have great transit systems. They just recognize that forcing developers to oversupply parking was only creating negative impacts on their communities. So, Again, in a Buffalo or Fayetteville, the developers will supply more parking than in San Francisco, but they are gonna be smarter about the right number of parking spaces than government is going to be. That a one-size-fits-all solution that is imposed by government only creates negative outcomes, and the only function that it serves is allowing us to mismanage the public right-of-way. I know uh, I don't Mr. Want to get into would, uh, an argument would, uh, about uh, <laughs> housing markets in Buffalo and Fayetteville and housing markets in Santa Cruz and the price of housing mm -hmm. and the incentive to developers to build more units uh, and use more of the land for housing and less of the land for parking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might affect it somewhat. So look at Santa Monica then. You know, I mean, Santa Cruz is unique in many ways, but one thing that is not unique about Santa Cruz is the desire to drive. Driving is convenient for everyone. It's the same everywhere. We love driving because it is so convenient. 
We just need to recognize that when we choose the convenience of driving, that has consequences. Um, and consequences that actually may get in the way of our own desire to drive by encouraging more people to drive in front of us. Uh, I'm sure that's, that's a fertile ground <laughs> of uh, a discussion. I certainly don't uh, disagree I'll, with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm gonna look to Ms. Johnson. Thank you, I had a question for staff and then a question for you. So how is our county doing in our cities on um, level of service versus VMT? Have we made the switch yet? We have not. Um, I know there are some efforts um, happening and I've heard some complaints from the public works um, corners. Um, Jeff asked me this question earlier when we were out in the hall and um, I, I, don't, I think the uh, level of interest on the level of service question is um, it's very divided you know, between the planning and the engineering community. Um, and it's been, it's been very, very slow in being pushed forward by the state. I think part of the problem is the confusion on how to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and technically, it, it is complicated, and I think that question was raised earlier, so that's the reason. Now, there is a deadline, and so we're all gonna have to learn how to do it, um, and we do have, one of our staff has been following the regulations and the updates to CEQA and so on. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any rigorous application of that change yet in our county. Are, are, are there any studies, any data that we can point to that say that if we move from level of service to VMT as required, that that's going to increase density um, in housing in downtown areas or wherever? Yeah, it, within the quarters, yeah. Uh, well, sure, I mean, like, w greater density in places that are walkable and near transit, that's the most effective way to cut your vehicle trip generation rate, as well as the length of those motor vehicle trips. So a VMT approach rewards density near transit, but CEQA isn't going to force any community to increase allowable density, right? So there's the California Environmental Quality Act analysis, and then there's zoning control, and those are very different. But what you know, switching to VMT does is it says that auto-dependent sprawl, that's problematic, and you're gonna have to find a way of mitigating that, not by moving the development farther away, but by shifting motor vehicle trips. Yes, yeah, so I understand that VMT, I understand that's what VMT mm -hmm. does, but I guess my question was, is there actually any studies that demonstrate that density would be affected, but I think we're just assuming it will be, or it could be. It, it certainly changes the market dynamics, right. and it makes local jurisdictions think like, okay, if, if I've got to accommodate another 20,000 housing units, mm -hmm. the way to do that that is going to result in the best environmental performance and traffic performance is to, is to concentrate that near transit and walkable Thank services. You. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I should add that uh, the locations that have already adopted their 743 rules are Pasadena, um, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. Um, and all four of the cities, the process was remarkably easy. Uh, it took a few months um, for both um, San Francisco and Oakland. Um, they both ran through processes that in addition to a limiting level of service and substituting VMT in a very s simple way of analyzing that, um, they increased uh, the uh, development impact fee for transportation uh, because that was a useful trade. So uh, in both of those cities, they've basically eliminated consultant work yeah. on the transportation side, right? Like we're really expensive. All of that pointless traffic analysis, you know, those 300 page reports that we used to write, that's gone. It, they basically go through a checklist and pay a fee um, and as a result of that, developers um, agreed to pay a substantially greater fee in exchange for avoiding real estate attorneys and people like me, as well as shaving uh, two years off of their entitlement process. Wow, that's, that's huge, hmm. huge. Yeah, yep. thank you. Uh, Ms. Chase, or? I'm actually good, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for your talk. It, it really was excellent. Um, in, in response to Randy Johnson's excellent question about like how we got here, or what our individual choices are, I think your, your answer, another way to put um, your response is that it's not so much about what individual choices we make in the <coughs> given the current choices that we have in front of us, you make the choices you make and that might be driving 
for a variety of reasons, but more about what are the choices and what, how we you know, change the structure of what people are looking at as those options. And sort of what interests me would be a little bit more detail about how you manage to get values consolidation or you know, people to agree about the <laughs> values of equity and so forth, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah. The most rational thing this county could do about our Highway 1 problem is turn one of those lanes into the existing lanes into an HOV lane. Yep. Overnight, you would have people finding ways to find people to drive with, and they would get there really quickly. And you know, you sitting here and stuck in traffic, it wouldn't take very long for people to say, "How do I get in that lane? What's it take?" Um, there are similar situations with parking decisions that city makes. Um, but the problem is, right now, if you were to do that, I mean, this commission has the you know, ultimately working with the, the state of California, we could probably make that happen if we decided we wanted to do it. But believe me, we'd all be recalled from whatever positions we visit. <laughs> you know, yes, I recognize that. Public member. Very, yes. <laughs> very, very quickly. Even yep. those of us that are appointed would be recalled somehow. Yes. I don't know how it would happen, but it would. Yes. Um, and the same thing with the city that wants to decide, well, you know, if we really provided people with the transit passes and these other kinds of things in, in a really clear way, simultaneously with just reducing the parking, the free parking or the low cost parking that's available, people would change their behavior. But what would happen in the meantime, and it would be a meantime, is some businesses would go out of business because people would go, I can't find parking near that thing and so I'm not going there. And if the city of Santa Cruz became radically underparked, let's say, or not, let's call it underparking, but reduced its parking, people would go to the 41st Avenue and go to Capitola and shop and vice versa. So how, given the fact that we have different, um, first of all, how, how within a community like Oakland did you decide you're gonna move more in this direction? And how do you make these decisions when your city might be ahead of the other, you know, I'm not saying that Santa Cruz would be ahead of Watsonville, they might be ahead of us, but how does one city decide to do this when you're competing shopping markets? Um, basically to still provide free parking? Mm -hmm. Well, so partly you need to recognize the way in which the status quo is failing. So by providing free parking, and having those spaces be mostly full, you're driving customers away, right? So you'll drive customers away if you charge too little and make parking annoying. You'll drive customers away if you charge too much and your parking is empty. So again, it's about looking at the transportation system as a big sound board with a lot of dials, right? And you've got to get all the dials adjusted just so. And if anyone is too far to the left or too far to the right, it's going to sound terrible. So we tend to think in extremes in this industry for some reason um, and like use the slippery slope arguments in order to um, n avoid having an effective debate. Your task as policymakers is to figure out like the Goldilocks spot, like not too hot, not too cold, just right. And also recognize that we have a limited tolerance for change, right? So going too fast down one direction, even if it's well-intentioned, can result in backlash. So incremental steps are always uh, easier to deal with. But very importantly, if you're clear about values and performance metrics, you can be clear about project objectives and continually evaluate projects as you go along based upon what had been promised and what the values were and make adjustments, including, as government, deciding, oh yeah, that project did not succeed, unintended negative consequences, let's undo it and start again. This is something that most government agencies are terrified about, right? So we get stuck in the status quo, as opposed to being clear about the direction we want to head and continually, incrementally making changes in that direction and being unafraid of failure. Um, I mean, that. The biggest part of my job in Oakland was providing cover for my staff people to go out and do their good work, to make sure that if anyone on the city council ever started, the public started accusing them of doing something, no, no. Like, you praise staff when things have gone well, you criticize me when things have gone wrong, um, and it's my job to basically uphold your policies, right? And to continually ask you, like, okay, you said these were your priorities. Are you sure those are your priorities? Because I, you know, I'm just staff. We're just here to implement those. Um, it required also training my staff in how to <laughs> fail skillfully. Because in most government agencies, no failure is acceptable. I come from the private sector. 
Um, if you're not failing at the right pace, you're gonna quickly be out of business. That in the private sector, it's all about risk management and risk taking in order to accommodate changes that are external and coming at us, right? Am I gonna <coughs> respond to the changes that are coming down the road, or am I just gonna sit here <coughs> passively and operate my business like it was still 1975? So, you know, as policymakers, it's your task, you hold the values and you need to provide clear direction to staff about the direction the county should be heading in and demand that they report back on progress and have a way of measuring the degree to which they are actually doing what you told them to do. And to constantly be investigating the unintended negative consequences of you know, your very well-intentioned ideas, but sometimes things don't work out as expected, like with level of service. It seemed like it made, it was a measure of congestion. It seemed like it was a perfect way of eliminating congestion. Oh, oops. It actually worsened the problem rather than solved it. Uh, uh, thank you again for your uh, presentation. I, I'd actually already got an, an email from someone who came to last night's presentation appreciating uh, 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 what you presented. I just had a couple of questions. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the question about level of service and VMT, I think, is an important one, and I think we have to wrestle with it uh, uh, in in some way. And to be clear about what our values are, uh, the the our regional transportation commission worked to um, in our last uh, major overhaul of our regional transportation plan come up with scenarios and at they, the staff asked us what our values were. Do we want to improve uh, reliable tra travel time? Do we want to did we want to uh, reduce admissions? Did we want to promote equity? And I thought that was a useful exercise uh, for us to start um, looking at it. And it may, uh, this talk makes me think that maybe we should be looking, there should be some measure of that in the decisions that we make on our regular agenda so we're clear that we're following what we said we were gonna do in the plan. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. We're, we have a major, uh, study coming out um, th uh, that, that is eagerly awaited called our Unified Corridor Investment Study, looking at our three major uh, corridors. We're gonna have different scenarios and we're gonna be asked to make these value decisions uh, once again and we'll, we'll kind of see if we're still on the same track or not. Um, but uh, as you just mentioned, in terms of, of uh, making changes and not being afraid to fail, uh, there are consequences, however, of that. So I, you know, this is, uh, a, the county uh, is, uh, did a sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, which looked at modest increases in densities along our transit corridors. It's, that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? That's uh, all experts will say. Um, and we reduced our parking standards. Um, uh, and the fear will be, and I know I'll hear it from constituents once we're done with the environmental work, is that, hey, they're parking in my neighborhood now. Um, and then we're gonna have the same request that they see in the city of Santa Cruz, create a parking program so you can keep those people out of my neighborhood. How do you manage that transition? Yeah. Uh, um, and because uh, I get what you're saying, is, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure I completely believe that the market will figure it all out. Um, but, uh, and I believe we have to have some um, basic standards, but how do, you, how do you manage that transition um, between what people have always expected and, and the impacts that will be real. Yeah, and particularly with parking. Parking is a fun topic because it's oftentimes a proxy for completely unrelated fears and anxiety. So you need to recognize that there will always be complaining about parking because it is not possible to make people happy about parking and the parking complaint may really be code for something else. So. Um, you have residential parking permit districts here in Santa Cruz. They are anti-market and anti-democratic and anti-equitable. But if they are what is necessary in order to allow your higher values to be able to move forward, sometimes it's okay to do that. So something that many, particularly coastal California cities that have um, a, a deeply entitled existing population that is afraid of change, living in predominantly single family home neighborhoods. Those single family home neighborhoods, like there's not gonna be any development in those neighborhoods. It's okay to just freeze those places in amber as a way of both acknowledging that folks living in that neighborhood 
a lot of them have been there for a long time and they've built lives around the expectation of free and available parking and they are concerned that their lives will be greatly disrupted. Some of them just want to stop other people from moving into the neighborhood, sure. right? So differentiating between the actual motivations of people who are afraid of change and acknowledging that there are things that people are legitimately concerned about and you can manage around that even if the management technique is something anti-democratic like residential permits. Um, I always draw residential permit boundary districts around the single family home neighborhoods and then deed restrict any corridors of change from ever being able to join that residential permit district. So you create a line between like, okay, these are like our existing areas that are afraid of change and these are our areas of change and we're gonna like draw some lines to protect those folks both from rational as well as irrational concerns. That's okay. If that's what's necessary in order to meet your housing affordability goals and meet those goals in places that don't require low-income people to drive endlessly, therefore eliminating any of the financial benefit of the income-restricted housing. Um, I appreciate that, and I, it's it's a lot harder to do than to just talk about it, right? I oh, know, yeah. I know you know that, right? I mean, I'm Yes. Gonna, no, I've been uh, to all those workshops. Yeah. Believe me, I've been yelled at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we're going to face it here in the county as we look. You know, we have the voters set an urban services boundary of concentrate development. We, mm -hmm. we're, we've we uh, just done this plan that, that sort of... Uh, 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 recertifies that by saying we're going to increase densities and it's going to be very hard to get people to change. Uh, we've done a lot of, a lot of conversations about it. Um, the, the, uh, uh, I was curious about, uh, the, you know, you, you uh, portrayed very clearly um, that the widening of highways is, is, uh, is a losing game. Um, and I think even Caltrans, I've heard uh, uh, Kelly uh, make this presentation that it's, that it's a losing game. Uh, but that's what the voters here said. They want auxiliary lanes here in Santa Cruz. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and but w we're one of the one of the um, uh, uh, debates we're having here in Santa Cruz is the question of whether we're going to use our rail line for passenger service or not. And one of the the complaints we get is you'll never get enough people to reduce the congestion on Highway One. And if I'm understanding your argument uh, correctly, is there's no way that we'll ever reduce the congestion on Highway 1 because as soon as we add space, we will fill the space. That's the induced traffic. Demand. That's right. The, no matter what you do with a rail corridor, no matter how magical, futuristic, whatever you're doing with that corridor, it will not have any impact on Highway 1. It will have no more impact on Highway 1 than adding a lane to Highway 1 will have on Highway 1 because all of that capacity will fill with latent demand. Yeah. And that's okay, that, that's not say, don't do some great project on the rail corridor. There are many very good reasons for doing a project on that corridor. Solving congestion definitely is not one of them. I mean, uh, and I think a, a good example of that is up in Santa Rosa where, you know, 5,000 homes went away and Highway 101 didn't certainly become empty all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, it was, it's still clogged. Yeah, uh, Los Angeles spent $4.5 billion widening the 405 through Sepulveda Pass, only to have the widened highway open more congested than the narrower highway was after enduring six years of severe construction-related congestion. Um, and think about, like, because transportation is a complex system, so, okay, you've, you've just expanded capacity by, say, 20%. You're moving 20% more cars. Is there 20% more off-ramps and surface streets right. to accommodate that? No, you, you, when you widen, you move the bottleneck from one place to another. Yeah. Well, and I was very, uh, you know, this uh, work that you've done in Oakland um, about uh, equity, I think is ver really important, uh, uh, it, trying to figure out where we'd find the resources to be able to have that discussion. Uh, it, it, I, I think of as a county supervisor and I've, uh, I'm trying to get uh, our board to think about where we make our infrastructure investments should be tied to where we're asking people to live and, and both in terms of uh, roads, uh, bike lanes, sidewalks, and parks, um, that there's, a, there's an equity uh, question here of whether the single family home neighborhoods are gonna have all those things and the urban uh, or more urban where we're areas where we're asking for density that somehow we're not going to invest more money in there as we're asked more people to live there. 
So I think it's, uh, uh, I appreciate that work and I'm going to uh, take a look more closely at what you did uh, in Oakland because I think there may be parts of it that we should be doing here in Santa Cruz. Anyway, I want to thank you uh, for it. We're, we're, uh, it's a public meeting, so uh, I ask, uh, we get to ask members of the public. Oh, uh, Mr. Dondero. Yes, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, well, I could have lots of questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll limit it. Um, I was really pleased to hear you bring up performance metrics in, in many different aspects, and um, we are doing that in this corridor study that we're doing right now. So hopefully our, our board will have um, more than just a gut reaction, but will have some measurable things to base their decisions on. We also have incorporated performance metrics in our regional plan not to the extent that we wanted to at the time, because as you know, gathering data is expensive. That's right. However, since now that we're a self-help county, hopefully we can do more of that in the future. Um, I thought the example of Oakland was great. I've lived in Oakland before, and I know that what a complex city it is. Um, but you had the advantage in that you had a, a large domain to work within that had one governing body. <laughs> And one of the, one of the <laughs> frustrations uh, for me and for our staff working in this, this uh, regional agency is that um, we serve um, many different masters and you know we've got four incorporated cities and then we've got half the county lives in unincorporated areas, which is kind of unique. And so um, trying to uh, execute something like what you did in Oakland um, it's hard for me to even imagine where to start, um, and I just w wonder if you have any uh, hmm, brief advice for a regional agency that would like to move the county in a, in a stronger direction. I think, for, for example, the equity question comes up over and over and over again. It's getting more voice, and we have, we have that um, challenge, but I, I don't think we're anywhere close yet to really grappling with it. And so I just wonder if you have any suggestions for a regional transportation agency mm -hmm. that doesn't do zoning and doesn't have the control over a lot of those other decision points that, that you maybe you did in Oakland. Yep, uh, good question, it's complicated here. So another rule about performance metrics is to make sure that you're using the fewest possible metrics that reflect all of your goals and where there's existing or readily available data by which you can measure those goals. Um, it's quite easy to have performance metric systems get wildly complicated. Um, that's not gonna help you because then they will not get used. Um, so in Oakland, we uh, like, you know, severely resource constrained space. All this tool development was done by city staff part time. Uh, just basically mining the data warehouse from the city to f try to figure out what could we use in order to answer some of the key questions? Another thing, piece of advice that I would give is to focus on the, um, the values and metrics that are the critical decision, the, the things where you're stuck. Uh, a lot of the, the stuff that's easy and there's agreement about, that's not gonna help you make a decision about do I do this project or do I do, I do that project? In fact, one of the things that we realized was that the most important uh, work for your performance metrics is being able to say no to a project that is a seemingly good idea but just doesn't cut it given our limited resources. It's a tool for saying no to constituents and being able to tell a story behind that about why, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, but we just can't afford that given these priorities. So at the county level, um, there I'm assuming if it's like Alameda County, you have astonishingly good public health data um, because the medical, unlike the transportation industry, which never does post-project evaluation, right? In the medical profession, like after you do the surgical procedure, they actually go and check on you to see how you're doing and learn from that. So the medical profession has great empirical data on health outcomes, um, and uh, they should be able to parse that down to a localized level to see what are health outcomes. Another uh, area of data that you should have immediate access to is your safety data. Where are you killing people? Like, can we all agree that killing people on our streets is bad? Uh, it's usually a very easy way of prioritizing resources is to solve critical um, safety problems. Um, all of the demographic data 
all that is publicly available and you can break all of it down to the census block group and have a very, very fine level of mapping around household income, age, both um, seniors as well as uh, young people. Um, you should be able to get data on disability. What's the pattern of where disabled folks live in your community? Um, absolutely race, uh, tenure, so whether you're an owner or a renter. Um, and then you should be able to do, so with some additional post-processing, um, where, for example, um, uh, rent-challenged households, so people who are of low income and are experiencing high or rising rents. So tracking the impact of gentrification on your low income population is also something that you can do and map readily if you've got a decent GIS. Um, other things that you can do are take all of this and just put it all online. You've got phenomenally smart people here in Santa Cruz County, and there are data nerds who will volunteer to play with your data in order to find things that are meaningful and tell stories about that. And that was something we absolutely relied upon in Oakland was a lot of volunteer hours because people cared very passionately and they were willing to invest their own time. So we made a commitment to transparency, just putting it all out there in part to build trust, but also because we kept ending up with people calling us up saying, hey, like I've got this other data layer. Do you mind if I do, uh, you know, like download all your GIS shape files and play around with it? Like, sure, and here's how you post the results of that. Just put it all up on our website. Yeah. So you, you, there's a lot that you can do with existing staff and existing tools. Um, and don't let um, perfection be the, the enemy of the good. Right. Um, so now I'm gonna ask if there's members of the public who, who have any uh, comments or questions. Um, they're gonna come up there, uh, Mr. Tumlin. Uh, excuse me? Two or three minutes. Two minutes. Hi, Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. I just want to say thank you to Mr. Tomlin for a wonderful presentation. I found a lot of it, all of, most of it, almost all of it resonated with me very strongly. Um, I loved Mike Rotkin's idea of just kind of creating an HOV lane out of what we already have. Um, it could also be a lane that people could pay to drive single in if, as an alternative. Um, and I just want to, I heard a comment that the county voted for highway widening, and at least from my perspective, we did not vote for highway widening. I personally looked at Measure D and said, well, I hate this highway widening, but there's so much good stuff in it that I'm going to have to vote for it. And I'm, I'm imagining I'm not the only one that voted for Measure D completely in spite of the highway widening and not wanting the highway widening. So please consider looking at alternatives to the highway widening. Thank you very much. Good point. Thank you. Anyone else? I know we had a public uh, session last night and so there was a chance to ask questions. I, I just want to offer my thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Tumlin uh, and for uh, Mr. Dondero for uh, identifying him as a speaker. This is part of a speaker series that is all available online and is to help the community conversation about the transportation choices that we make. Uh, we just have one more item. Oh, uh, Mr. Let's, let's once again appreciate that talk. That was incredible. Yeah. Thank you. I think Mr. Bertrand had one, uh, one final question. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, um, Maybe a little bit out of the field, but when you said you're from San Francisco, I know that um, there's a parking and a street cleaning program. Okay, so I'm interested in two things. One is uh, parking and street cleaning. Uh, we almost have a controlled experiment. Uh, San Francisco does, uh, you have to move your cars two times a day, um, excuse me, two times a week, in areas around here, as far as I know, you don't. Uh, Capitola, you certainly don't have to move. Um, the other one is the effect of um, ADUs on parking. I know the state has uh, relaxed uh, parking requirements. So in the interest of time, I'd just like to know, are there any nuggets that you could give us about this? Because um, in a sense, a parking program that requires you to move your car for street cleaning, which is good for the environment, and we're very concerned about our bay here, could reduce the available parking in aggregate, right? And the other is the ADU in terms of parking in the neighborhood and the community's acceptance of that. 
It uses sort of a slow change, and it does have an effect on parking. Those two questions. Okay, so uh, there is also Mary Brown, quite some time ago, I'm trying to remember the name of her study, um, did some interesting analysis in San Francisco, which has minimum parking requirements, but has no enforcement of making sure that your uh, parking space is actually used for storing your car. Uh, there's some like ridiculous statistic about the overwhelming percentage of garages, residential garages in San Francisco that are used for storing stuff yes. rather than cars. And which seems like, why should government force me to only store a car in this giant storage space? Like, shouldn't I be able to store whatever I want? But, you know, we're not rational uh, when it comes to parking. So one thing that we have found in San Francisco is so the, the street sweeping rules vary all over the city. There are many streets that have no street sweeping, some that do. I've actually been in a couple of neighborhoods that went through the change. And lo and behold, when you impose street sweeping, a big percentage of parking demand goes away because people clear the junk out of their garages right. and put their cars back in them so, so they don't have to have the hassle of moving them around. Thank you. So in every case that I've seen, there's been no significant negative impact on availability. Um, because there's this flexibility in the market. Um, and then I f now I forget your second question. Uh, ADUs, I mean, we're uh, starting yeah, yeah. to go in that direction. Right? Yeah, so another thing, so again, residential parking permit controls are anti-market and anti-equity, but they're useful if you want to achieve your larger goal of providing more naturally occurring affordable housing. So things you can do are limit the number of residential permit per parcel or deed restrict ADUs from being able to join the parking district. You can also do hybrid programs where um, you allow outsiders to pay to park in the residential district. Um, so you can switch, you can have the homeowner have discounted privilege parking and have the new renters be charged market, which gets particularly anti-equitable and an anti-market. But if it solves the problem of allowing uh, tolerance for ADUs, then the net impact to equity and to the marketplace is potentially significantly positive, right? Don't, don't be afraid, just because the status quo is so broken, don't be afraid of breaking it even further as part of the path towards getting to a more rational, equitable approach. <laughs> That's a good way to end. Uh, <laughs> break the mold, break, break the mold. mold. Uh, thank you again uh, for your presentation. We, we just have one item left on our agenda, which is the uh, minutes from our August 16th uh, Transportation Policy Workshop meeting. Uh, Mr. Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I noted that an item I brought up um, last meeting was not noted in the meeting minutes, and I'd like that to be added. And um, in particular, it was about bringing an item agenda for discussion of this commission, and that item agenda was, and you know, staff could go back and look at uh, the meeting minutes, but um, that item agenda was to, to bring forth a discussion about how we might uh, move forward on evaluating the uh, investment study in terms of a committee of commissioners. Thank you very much. So I'd like to have that added to the uh, agenda, and, excuse me, the meeting minutes, thank you. Yeah, uh, um, I'll hold on, uh, Mr. Rock, and uh, so I, I remember the request, and I remember also even making the comments that, that we're all responsible for reading this, the, that uh, I'm not exactly sure what a, a, a committee of, uh, uh, or who would even appoint the committee. I, as a chair, I'm expecting everyone here to fully read this very important study that we've been talking about for a year, uh, and engage the material. And people, of course, are free to, to join with other commissioners uh, within the, l the letter of the law, right? Uh, that, uh, as long as you don't have a majority and, and, and work on the material together. I'm just not sure what um, uh, assigning a, a subcommittee to look at this material would have any effect on, on our conversation or value. Okay, um, I do remember your comments at the time, and I um, wanted to have that before the commission to decide, and that's why I wanted to be agendized. Okay, you're absolutely right. It's our duty to read the report and come up with um, in-depth questions and analysis. Uh, my point was that a committee of peers here uh, would do a much better job as a group 
as opposed to individually. And as a group, we would bounce about ideas back and forth and stuff like that. So basically, I wanted that agendized so this commission could decide if that's the way we could go. Not whether it's valuable or not at this time, but an agendized item. Uh, Mr. Rockin. Well, I, I'm generally in favor of the idea that members of the commission have the ability to get something on the agenda. I, I agree with your comments, uh, Mr. Chair, that it may not be helpful to have such a committee, but what I'm gonna move is that we um, uh, refer the uh, minutes to the staff, have them find out whether that request was made, you know, was in fact made, I believe it was, but just to double check it was made, um, and have this agendized at a future meeting in which I think the first thing that would happen is I'm, I, I will probably move to table it, but it, I think he has a right to try and get it on the agenda and see what this, the response of the uh, commission is to it. Um, uh, I look to our lawyer for, that, that seems like a reasonable action that we can take uh, given that we're d d deciding the minutes, okay. Uh, so there's a, a motion uh, by Rockin to review the, the, the staff tape, to it. staff to review the tape, um, and if there's a request to put it on the agenda, that we have it on the next agenda. That's it. Uh, this, and that was made by Rockin, seconded by Johnson. Any other discussion? Anyone in the public? All in f favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And with that, we end uh, the meeting. Our next meeting uh, is, uh, is listed on the agenda as September 20th to be at the regional transportation offices. Uh, this is gonna be a, a special meeting of the commission that's not gonna be at the regional transportation uh, commission office. It's gonna be at the Metro Transit District offices and we will be interviewing the finalist for executive director of the RTC. Um, so there will be a public portion briefly at the, at the, at the beginning of that meeting, um, but uh, the rest of it will be in closed session. Uh, so I ask that we make that change. Uh, and our next regularly scheduled Regional Transportation Commission meeting is uh, back here again on Thursday, October 4th. Um, thanks uh, uh, for Community TV for uh, filming today. Thanks for everybody's participation. I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, so the, the 20th TPW.